2006, they celebrated their 100th anniversary, uh, beginning with Scott Chambers, and uh, his daughter uh, was the first licensed female mortician in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. And today they are continuing on in their fourth generation. We are very grateful to them for hosting the event this evening, and for to Chris, forever. Yes, there he is, <laughs> hiding back there, for speaking to us this evening. So, without any further ado, we will turn the program over to Chris, and thank you for being our speaker this evening. You're very welcome. Thank all of you for being here. I have to admit, I don't think I'm neither alone nor distinguished, but I appreciate the nice introduction, and, and thank you all so much for coming out. I didn't know what to expect as far as a turnout this evening. It's such a beautiful night outside, and considering the summer we've had, I was beginning to think we were living in Seattle, so for this many folks to show up, I don't know whether to be very grateful and, and uh, thankful for, for all of that, or if that says more about this event or more about you all. Maybe you didn't have as much to do tonight, but thank you so much for being here. And I, I want to reiterate before we get started, um, please make sure to take some time. We bought some refreshments. Unfortunately, it's not sugar-free. I told the baker to go ahead and send good. It's, it's whatever they had, the best that they had as far as cookies and brownies and things. So please be sure to take some of that. If you don't eat any, eat any of it while I talk, please be sure to take some home with you. I'd appreciate it. Neither Steve nor I want to carry that home this evening. So if you have an opportunity, please try and do that. Um, when, uh, I also want to thank uh, Mike and Ann for inviting us to be part of uh, this meeting this evening. And, and uh, when Ann contacted me, she said that she would like for me to uh, give a historical perspective of the funeral home. And, uh, Back in 2006, we had our 100 year anniversary. So at that time, there was a lot of uh, studying and research and things that I was doing. Um, I don't know how many of you attended. I know several of you were here that day. And we had our 100 year anniversary celebration. We tied that in with Old Fashioned Day here. And it was really just a grand event. And uh, really enjoyed that. And also gave me an opportunity to learn a lot more about our family's history. Because through the years, <coughs> working at the funeral home or growing up in the communities and things, um, Steve and I, being associated with the business, are very fortunate from the standpoint that we have a lot of different people come in who will stop and pause and begin to tell us questions about maybe our grandmother or our grandfather or our great-grandfather, things we had never heard before. And I know we've talked about that oftentimes, that we really appreciate that because it gives us an opportunity to learn more about them. Um, I was rather young when my grandparents passed away. I never knew my great-grandfather. And so I've learned a lot of history actually from people in the community. So I appreciate uh, folks sharing that with me. But what I'd like to do tonight is to give you a little bit of uh, history on the funeral home from what I know. Um, it may not necessarily be all dates and facts and things. Like I said, a lot of the stories and things I have learned through the community as well as from family members and things. Probably several of you in the room. I know Asa has, has shared different things with me through the years. There's probably things that, that he could tell you that I probably am still not even aware of. But I'm going to give you a little bit of background as far as what I know. And unfortunately, Buddy's not here this evening, but he's kind of our family historian, Buddy Grubbs. And uh, Buddy has provided me a lot of different facts and things through the years um, and, and knows a lot more about history as well. But what I'd like to do first is just kind of start how the funeral home came about being. Um, back in 1906, this is a story that I have always been told. My great-grandfather, Scott Chambers, who was raised down in the Petersburg area, um, he was a horse trader, from my understanding, and evidently he was a pretty good horse trader. And uh, Mr. Chambers um, decided uh, he had an opportunity to buy a horse farm in Lexington. So Mr. Chambers, in those days, as many of you are well aware of, in order to travel, folks came to Walton to catch the train. So he rode his horse um, to Walton and came. And in fact, I have some pictures and things here. So if you can hand me that frame right behind you there, if you would. Mm -hmm. And it, also, if you have an opportunity, go by and look at some of these pictures and things. Um, if any of you would like to, uh, or like for me to, I'd be glad to explain things. Mike, if you wouldn't mind passing that around. I think that's my favorite picture of the history of the funeral home. It shows my great-grandfather, Scott Chambers, on his horse in front of a livery and feed stable, uh, mortuary and funeral directing company, and coal company. Five different things, which basically he did it all, I guess, in order to stay, stay in business. But when he came up that day to buy a horse farm in Lexington, Kentucky, and he left his horse at this livery stable you're about to see, the same livery stable 
was in what is now Main Street Restaurant, where the parking lot is down here on, on Main Street. That's where that building was located at. And uh, he left his horse there, um, caught the train, went to Lexington, and for one reason or another, we still don't know the details, I've asked different people, I've never had people actually tell me the, the true story, but the deal fell through. And evidently Papa, as we know him, uh, or, or know of him, um, was really disappointed, kind of frustrated that that had happened. Well, the livery stable initially was owned by uh, uh, Mr. Offen and Demoise, I believe. There's also a Hume name that I've come across, but Offen and Demoise are the two that I've always uh, basically researched. And Mr. Demoise evidently was interested in selling his app, interest in the business. So when Papa rode the train back from Lexington to Walton and uh, went to the livery stable to pick up his horse, Evidently, Mr. Alton approached him and said, would you have any interest in buying a funeral home? They began a conversation and began discussing it. Now, he had every intent to buy the horse farm, keep that in mind. Well, before the day was over, he owned half interest in delivery feed, uh, mortuary <laughs> service, and coal company. So he bought out half interest. Well, a year later, um, he ended up buying Mr. Alton out. And so he took sole proprietorship of the company. Um, there was an article in the Boone County Recorder, and it's in one of these uh, <coughs> books hereby, that tells of an article not there long after, I think maybe 1908 if I'm not mistaken, where Papa had gone across over in Danny, Indiana and brought a new, bought a new horse, or new, or new hearse, pardon me. And he came through Burlington, and they had a picture of the hearse, and telling him that was the first hearse, I guess, in, in the county at that time. And he how proud he was of that, driving it through, which was kind of neat. Now what I'd like, to, like you to do for me, if you would for just a moment, is I'd like for you to listen to something. I, I got on the internet just to kind of put things in perspective for me, and for most of you this will put things in perspective as well, though you all, obviously being part of the historical society, are greater historians than I. But just some statistics from the year 1906, from when he, uh, he actually bought interest into the funeral home, or into the mortuary service, I should say. Um, the average life expectancy was 47 years. Only 14% of the homes had a bathtub. Only 8% of the homes had a telephone. There were 8,000 cars and only 144 miles of paved roads. The maximum speed limit in most cities was 10 miles per hour. The average wage was 22 cents per hour. The average worker made between $200 and $400 per year. More than 95% of all births took place at home. 90% of all doctors had no college education, sorry doc. <laughs> Instead, they attended so-called medical schools, many of which were condemned in the press and the government as substandard. Sugar cost four cents a pound. Five leading causes of death were pneumonia and influenza, tuberculosis, diarrhea, heart disease, and stroke. The population of Las Vegas, Nevada was only 30. Crossword puzzles, canned beer, and iced tea hadn't been invented yet. Only 6% of all Americans had graduated from high school, and there were about 230 reported murders in the entire USA. Okay, now when you hear those facts, to me that was pretty fascinating, kind of put things in perspective for me. So what I want you to do for a minute is close your eyes. Okay? If you would, I want you to close your eyes and imagine a time similar to what I just described to you. Okay? Now, you're living out in the country. We just heard that there were only 144 miles of paved roads throughout the entire U.S. of A. I want you to think. You're living out at your home and you have a family member who dies. What do you do? You make a phone call. Only 8% of the homes have telephones. You send an email. <laughs> Do you yell loudly? Maybe. What do you do? Okay, open your eyes. Well, my great-grandfather bought half interest into the, I'll call it funeral business, mortuary service I keep replying it to, because keep in mind that that was not a funeral home. In, in Boone County, 1906, there were no funeral homes. I'll get to that in a moment. But at the time, if a death occurred, and granted, he was from Petersburg, so he buys half interest in a business down here in Walton. So he knew folks in Petersburg. So when someone died, and eventually the word would get out to Walton that that person had died and they contacted him to handle the preparations and take care of the final disposition of the person, how in the world would he have gotten 
There's no paved roads. Think about your drive down into Petersburg and Bellevue, Kentucky today on, on <laughs> paved roads. Think about that. Now think about it on horse and buggy in the middle of the night. Okay? That put it into perspective for me. When I thought about that, I thought, wow, that's really something. Granted, he probably didn't do it in the middle of the night. He probably waited till the next day. <laughs> the person had to lie there. I understand that. But that kind of put it in perspective. Today, if we receive a call in the middle of the night, our goal is to be at that house within the hour, whether that's 3 o'clock in the morning or 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Okay? Back then, that wouldn't be possible. So from a, from a whole standpoint of body preservation and what happens with someone at a time of death, it really provided some trickery. And we'll get into more of that in just a moment. Okay, so this is 1906. 1907, he buys the other interest out, and it becomes Chambers Livery Feed Stable, and I think it shows the picture there. Okay. Now, in 1904, I believe it is, I have my facts written down, my grandmother, Mary Elizabeth Chambers, was born. Okay? And a lot of people refer to it as Mary Scott, but actually Mary Elizabeth is, is what the formal genealogy says. She had an older sister, Eileen. Scott Chambers only had two, two children, biological children. Um, they were both daughters. Um, Mary, my grandmother, at a very young age, took an interest in what her dad did. I think her dad was kind of the apple of her eye, is a story that I get. But he took a, a big interest in what he did. Well, back then, women weren't funeral directors. They weren't in mortuary service. That wasn't something that was common. But at about the age of 12, she started going out, going back to the horse and buggy we were talking about before to go out to people's homes. She started going out with my great-grandfather to people's homes at a time of death and making removals and doing preparation with him. Um, she began school at an early age because her sister Eileen, Eileen we call her Amy. Amy was two years older than Maul, who is Mary Chambers, Mary, Mary Chambers Grubbs to me. Um, so she, uh, she started school when her older sister started school. So she started at a young age. She graduated high school at 16. At the age of 16, she already knew what she wanted to do. You know, I, I, I didn't have any idea what I wanted to do. In fact, I'm a Jonah. I think Steve was kind of that way. Most of the Grubbs men, I'll come back to that later. But I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. All I knew was I didn't want to be a funeral director. <laughs> and that's what I told everyone. Well, she knew what she wanted to do. This is what she wanted to do. So she, uh, she applied and went to mortuary school. I always thought that was at the age of 16, but I, I, after later researching a little bit more, I think she actually didn't get into mortuary school until she was about 17, and she went to Cincinnati College of Mortuary Science. She received her degree in a couple of years, and uh, she was not able to get her license at that point. Now, this is where the story shuffles a little bit. I had always heard that she didn't receive her license because she was a female. And females at that time weren't funeral directors, and so that was frowned upon, and so they weren't willing to give her her license. My Uncle Buddy Grubbs tells me that that's not necessarily the case, that there was some type of limbo, perhaps, with the license. I'm sticking to the story that she was <laughs> on. It's a lot more fascinating. <laughs> so she, uh, she uh, did not get her license until she turned 21. When she turned 21, <coughs> she was licensed, and she became the uh, first female mortician in the state of Kentucky. Her license, or copies of her licenses are up here on the wall, and it's dated, I believe, June of 1925, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. So, she got her license. Again, in fact, there's an ad up here on one of these boards that talks about, I guess Papa thought that would be an advantage to folks. Here it is. It says, a woman's work and says, Our Lady Assistant, Mary Scott Grubbs, a licensed embalmer, always assists in the care of women and children at no additional charge. <laughs> Chambers and Grubbs. <laughs> he was very proud of her. And uh, the first case she ever handled by herself was a Miss Shadler. Let me see if I can find this. I love this one, too. This, I think, other than that picture there of, of Papa on the horse <coughs> by the livery staple is probably my favorite. But it breaks down the contract, gives information about a Sally Shadler who died June 11, 1925. And it says, This body was embalmed by Mary Scott, the first call she ever answered by herself. 
and she done a fine job. Oh. <laughs> um, so, Mary Scott, Mary Elizabeth formerly, my grandmother, um, about the same time um, was engaged. But it's my understanding that the engagement was uh, to a gentleman, I won't call it a prearranged marriage, but there was a lot of forces, I think, working on that. To a young man from Owen County, and I honestly don't know the last name, but who was from the family of another funeral director. Um, kind of a merger, I guess, in some ways. Um, and uh, so that's the way it was set up. Well, my grandmother fell in love with somebody else. My grandfather, um, Wallace King Grubbs. And I don't know if Papa and what I call Boo, my grandfather, got along initially very well or not. I tend to believe probably not, because he had somebody else in mind for him. But uh, my grandmother, Mary Scott, and Wallace eloped. And it's my understanding it was kind of the traditional eloping, I think, the climbing out of the window and the whole thing. So they married, and uh, my grandfather at that time said that he never would be a funeral director. That's what I've always heard anyway. Again, that's the story I'm sticking to. It. So I always say that carries down from him. All the grown men have kind of said that. But uh, he said that he would never go into the funeral business. Well, as you saw, undertakers and embalmer, livery feed and sale stable on City Coal. Well, evidently, when after they got married, he went to work for my great-grandfather. And Papa evidently, from what I understand, was not only very detail-oriented. I'll tell you a little bit about Papa, just some background real quick. It's my understanding of stories that I've heard. He wore the long-tailed coat like you're going to a wedding, the white gloves, sometimes even the top hat. Had the finest of horses and things. Remember I said he was a horse trader. So, but everything had to be just so. Evidently he was pretty, pretty tough. So, um, when my grandfather, Boo, married my grandmother, Maul, and she was in the funeral business, evidently he went to work on the coal, for the coal part of the business. And he did that about two years, and so my understanding, again, this is word of mouth and hearsay, and maybe you all, some of you could tell me differently, was that after two years of working with the coal company, he felt like the funeral business wasn't such a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> so he decided to come back into the funeral business. So at that time, not long thereafter, um, the name of the funeral home was changed, and it was changed from Chambers Funeral Home to Chambers and Grubbs. Now, again, I don't know that it was really funeral home as much as funeral service. Okay, because we're still talking probably late 20s, maybe early 30. Um, at that time, the livery and feed stable was in that parking lot across the road. What is now, um, some of you knew when Buddy Grubbs purchased a home down here, that was my great grandfather's house. There's a sign on a mob colored home down here on Main Street that says Chambers Funeral Home. Okay, um, that was a pseudo funeral home, I'll call it. And the reason I say that is because my great-grandfather lived there. He and my great-grandmother lived there. In fact, when Steve was born, my mom and dad lived upstairs, and that was the apartment. And he was raised there for several years until they moved to Independence. But um, that home uh, was sometimes used for funeral services. Now, let me step back for a second. When we talk about funeral service at that time, funerals generally were conducted at that time in a church, in someone's home, because there weren't formal funeral homes in the area. Okay? Typically speaking, that was done. Now that project, pro, projects some logistical issues. Again, if someone dies in Petersburg and transfer, transfer that person's body back to Walton, say to do preparations by horse and buggy, it would have been very difficult, if not, I won't say impossible, but we'll, we'll just make it very challenging. Okay? So oftentimes back then, the preparations were done at the person's home. Um, Steve and I was thinking about this as I was, I was thinking about the historical society. I know several of you remember there was an old barn that used to be out here where the parking lot was expanded several years ago. And there was a three-car garage out there um, in front of that barn. And I can remember one summer, I can't remember how long ago that's been, Steve, if I was even in the business formally or not, but one summer the barn had gotten in bad shape and, and uh, so we were tearing it down. Well, there was a lot of different old things in that, in that barn. And right now I kick myself. I probably have bruises on the back of my, my, my behind from thinking about it. But there was a lot of things we threw out. A lot of it was probably beaten up or cracked or broken, but there was a lot of things in that barn I sure wish I had now. 
Um, but there were some utensils, there were some boxes of, of things that were used for funeral services out at, at different homes, and there were some utensils and uh, like injecting uh, equipment, things like that. But at that time, again, my understanding is is the preparations oftentimes would even be done in the kitchen, on a kitchen table. Okay, So preparations and things would be done there. I can't imagine OSHA or EPA today allowing that. <laughs> but back then, that, that was the case. And then things would be cleaned up. Um, bodily fluids and things would be taken outside and dumped. It would be cleaned back up. Go back to being a kitchen. So um, that brings me to the point of there was a need for funeral homes. And it was happening in other parts of the country, but it just hadn't happened in this area yet. So um, around 1936, my great-grandfather, in conjunction with my grandmother and grandfather, purchased this, which was a residence. And some of you may know, it, it escapes me, and, and I, I need to write that down. I don't have who the prior owners were of the house. And we've, we've yeah, so who was it? Roberts, R-O-B-E-R-T. Okay. And isn't there, somebody told me there's a picture now in Northern Kentucky views of the house before it was a funeral home, but I looked the other day and I couldn't find it. Is it, is it on there, do you know? This had a configuration just like where Renee lives now. In other words, a big gable, uh -huh. and that was it. And when you all remodeled, when the other folks a little older than you right. remodeled it, then they made it the colonial two-story it is. Okay, okay. And Mr. Nicholson, I believe, a uh, builder from over in that direction, is the one who came in and actually did the renovations on the Yes, it's George Nicholson and son. Okay. Um, but they came in at the time, around 36, to, to renovate. and. There's articles, uh, there's actually pictures up here and copies of the newspaper articles from the recorder and the local newspapers and things where they advertise the open house. And the open house to open the funeral home for the public was July, I believe, 3rd, 4th, and 5th of 1937. So that, when this, when this place opened at that time, this was the first funeral home in Boone County. So that's where it goes back to the historical perspective of it. Um, at that time, my grandmother and grandfather lived here, and then, uh, and six years later, 1943, I've got the date here somewhere. Again, I told you I wasn't going to go over a lot of dates, but I did get a few of them for you. Uh, January 12th, 1943, um, my great-grandfather, Scott Chambers, died. Um, so at that time, then, the business changed hands. Um, my grandmother and grandfather kind of took ownership of that. Um, there's been several locations of the funeral home um, since the inception, not of this particular one. And as far as additions and things, <coughs> this room that you see over here, this, this flower, and the picture that I have of the funeral home, in fact, you can see it right here. If you come up here, you'll see this was actually a carport at one time that people drove through. It had some really neat awnings at the time. It kind of reminds me, there's another picture I have somewhere and the home at one time kind of reminded me of uh, the house on the old show Dallas, the opening of the white house that sits out in this thing. That's kind of what it reminded me of when I would see pictures. But uh, there's pictures there that will give you an idea of what it initially looked like. And it hasn't changed dramatically through the years as far as the outside appearance of it. Not really. Not dramatically. Um, there's a lot of old furniture and things that you'll see in here um, that is original. Um, there's some pieces in the office you might want to take a look at. But as far as funeral homes, um, th their expansion and how that proceeded then from there, um, they opened a funeral home in Walton. Many of you probably remember the funeral home that was uh, where Florence Christian Church is now. Um, Jerry Rouse and, and uh, Buddy Manage, um, that my grandparents owned at the time. Um, the uh, location out on Burlington Pike, um, which is now Lindemann Funeral Home, that was built in 1976. I can remember when that was built being in the back of the truck and it was a big thing because of the bicentennial year and they had different things and the carpet things that were used for that. Um, there was a funeral home actually in Independence prior to the Independence Funeral Home that you know now that was close to where U.S. Bank is downtown close to the courthouse that my grandfather evidently bought I'll say in the late 30s, early 40s, I was told, but it didn't last very long. It was only open maybe a year or two across from like where Swindler Kern Funeral Home is. Um, my parents, story goes, Jim and Janice Grubbs, um, they were living, as I mentioned, upstairs from my great-grandfather's home just down the street here. And my grandfather, Wallace, who I call Boo, approached my mom one day and said, 
how would you feel about uh, uh, starting a funeral home over in Independence? Well, they had been living there, I want to say about three years maybe, from the time that they were married. And she was ready to do anything to get out of there and have her own place. And she said, well, that'd be great. So she was all excited. So Dad, one day, Dad was, used to be a real practical joker. And so on a Sunday afternoon, they drove over to Independence, where the funeral home currently is. And if any of you know where that is, at one time, that was just a little uh, farm structure there. Um, I believe it was part of Hoffman Estates, maybe. Um, it's right there. But maybe a four-room building or something. And when they got over there, the, the door was hanging off of the hinges. The drop, there was no drywall or kind of plaster on walls. Just things were kind of framed up. And he pulled up. Um, I wonder if there's chickens and stuff in the yard or what she said, but it was like it was, it was a mess. And he pulled up in front of the building, and because he was always a practical joker, she thought he was joking. <laughs> so he stopped the car and said, Oh, Jimmy, stop it. Come on, take me where we're going. And he said, This is it. And she said, Jimmy, cut it out. He got out of the car, and uh, she kept saying, Get back in the car, get back in the car. Well, he goes up to the door, has a key, and again, she still thinks he's kidding until he stuck the key in and opened the door. There was a storm drill on the hinges, but there was a door in there. So he opened the door and she just started crying. And that's how the Independence Funeral Home started. And that's where Steve and I were raised. The Independence Funeral Home um, originated in 1963. And uh, um, or opened in 1963, I should say. And Steve was born in 60, I was born in 68. So uh, we were raised over there until I was a senior in high school. And there's a picture back here behind Dennis on the on the wall, I think it's an article from the Kentucky Post, January the 8th of 1985. I'll never forget that day. I was at basketball practice. I was a junior in high school, and mom and dad came in to get me, and they seemed upset, and I didn't know what was going on. I came out, and they said that, uh, or no, pardon me, it was not mom and dad, it was Mary McKinley that came to get me. But anyway, they came to get me from basketball practice. They looked upset, I came out, and they said that the Walt place had been on fire. And uh, mom had been upstairs working in an office in the uh, the uh, kerosene heater that she had in the office had ignited and caught the drapes. Unfortunately, they called the Walton Fire, De Fire Department. They responded immediately, got up here, put the fire out fairly quickly, but there was a lot of water damage. And Dad always wanted to move back here since he was raised here, and I'll, I skipped over that. I can come back to that. He was raised here in this house. He and his brothers and sisters, they lived here throughout his childhood. This was the place he always wanted to be. So uh, when they renovated the place, then we moved back over here. I was a senior in high school. And, August or September of 85. So they've lived here ever since. So in 1993, I believe it is, um, the location in Florence now, which is our Florence location down on US 25, that many of you may have known as a John Deere tractor facility that Ed Ryan had owned at one time, um, was purchased. And that was renovated and created a general home. And the story to that is, and I, I'm giving you a lot of not historical things, just my perspective again. Um, I was working with Owen Electric Cooperative at the time and had come in to visit. Um, I stopped in regularly and stopped in to see Dad. And he says, sit down. I was helping, part, helping out part-time at the time. He says, come in. I want to talk to you. I said, okay. He says, sit down. Anytime he says, sit down, that means something serious is wrong. <laughs> so I said, what, what, do you have to, what do you have to say? And he says, well, you know where Brian's place is on 25? And I said, yeah. And he says, you know it's for sale? I said, yeah. He says, well, I'm thinking about putting a funeral home in down there. What do you think? And being a supportive son that I was, I said, are you nuts? Because <laughs> <laughs> it was a green metal shell building, looked like a car dealership, but I have to give him credit. He had, he had the vision for it, and, and uh, it's worked out real well and served the community well. So, And we actually, we're currently renovating that. We've recently renovated Independence. We're renovating Florence currently, and hope to be renovating this place in another couple years. But... Uh, but so that's the story of the different locations. Um, as far as licenses, uh, I've talked to you about my grandmother. My grandfather became licensed as well. They had five children who are still living. My Aunt Jeanette, who's the eldest. Um, Jeanette Clore, some of you may know her. She lives down in Bellevue Bottoms area. Um, then his buddy, or Wallace, we all know him as Buddy Grubbs, um, who was a licensed um, funeral director and embalmer. And, uh, worked for the funeral home for years, retired, I would say, maybe 10 years ago now. That doesn't seem possible, but it's probably been close to that long. Um, my, uh, my uncle Johnny, who was superintendent of schools here in Walton, he's the only one. Jeanette fiddled with the funeral business a little bit. Buddy was licensed. Um, uh, Johnny was the one that said he, 
he never would go into it like the rest of us scrubs men, but he stuck to his guns. He, he went into education. Uh, my dad, Jim, who went into the business. And uh, then Liz, who at one time, uh, Elizabeth Four, um, many of you know her and Dean, she was in the business at one time as well. Eventually, everyone but Buddy and Dad um, got out of the business. Once Buddy retired, then Dad and Mom were the re uh, remaining of that generation. And uh, Steve and I now are fourth generation. So we're transitioning the business. We've actually purchased independence or in the process of purchasing the other location. So um, it's fourth generation as far as whether any of our kids or anything will follow us, who knows. But that's the heritage of it. So I'd be happy to answer any questions I can for you. There's a whole lot of details and things I probably skipped over. Some things maybe that you have curiosity to. And it's, by the way, this is Steve Grubbs. I keep referring to Steve, my brother in the back there, Steve next to Mr. Rouse. And this is his wife, Vicki Grubbs. Steve is a licensed embalmer and funeral director. Vicki's actually serving her apprenticeship right now and also takes care of her preening counseling and things. So um, yeah, it is still family owned and still family in the business. I have a wife who is like me, says she'll never go into business, and that'll probably stay true. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yes, well, two things, Chris. <laughs> I was a little guy when this, the Robertses lived here. When I said Robertses owned it, you know, when you're little, somebody lives there, they must own it. Right. So I'm not sure who technically had ownership of this property, but I think it was the Roberts. And uh, that was pretty neat. But one of the first things that happened in this funeral home, if you go back a little bit, my Uncle Scott, oh, yes, that always yeah. brings everybody yes. a smile. Yes. My uncle was Scott Jack, and if anybody ever lived that was a character, it was Uncle Scott. Well, during the Depression, Uncle Scott had graduated from Walton High School, and he was a good friend of Wallace and Mary, and even Mr. Grubbs, who was tough to get close to, but Uncle Scott could get close to anybody. Mr. Chambers or Mr. Grubbs? Mr. Chambers. Okay, okay. Oh, yeah. Anyhow, he worked for them during the Depression, and when they remodeled this, from the Roberts home to Chambers and Grubbs funeral home, Uncle Scott and Aunt Elsie were married right behind you in 1937, which is a pretty neat thing. Yes. Uncle Scott worked a lot part time even after he became a farmer, and he was a farmer all of my natural life as I can remember. But he worked part time for them because they, Mr. Grubbs or Mr. Chambers even would call him and say, Scotty. There are some people that won't even take us as their funeral director unless you're involved because you're the one that knew them to begin with. Right. So it was that sort of thing. And I've got to tell you one quick aside that's Uncle Scott's story personified. Chambers Grubbs had a pauper's funeral. And this pauper's funeral was, if you'll forgive me ladies, it was the pauper from hell funeral. Because nobody claimed this old gentleman he died, it was Chambers and Grubbs' turn to bury him, and he lived up a holla, and I'm not even gonna tell you the location because I don't want to reveal anything I shouldn't, <laughs> but it was up, up the holla from hell with the worst road in Boone County, and Wallace wanted no part of it, but he had to do it. And they decided that the only sensible thing to do was have the funeral in this guy's shack. They knew nobody would be there because nobody claimed the, the body, Nobody was interested in him at all. But of course, preachers always love to preach and hear themselves talk, so they did get a preacher. The preacher was there, and Wallace and Tick Shields and Uncle Scott, and I think maybe Jerry Rouse was there, but I'm not sure. But anyhow, they were up. <clears throat> they actually had the funeral off this awful road. It was rain, mind you. The road was bad enough, but it was raining. It was terrible. They got up there, and of course nobody showed up. And so the preacher, desirous of hearing himself talk, was standing on the other side of this very, very cheap casket. And, the, and, and Wallace and Uncle Scott and Jerry and Tick were there, trying their best to look composed, look sad, be as they should be. Rain, terrible, and Uncle Scott heard a car door. And Wallace whispered to Scott, who do you think that would be? Uncle Scott said, 
I think it's the flower car. <laughs> now that's a typical Uncle Scott joke. The most preposterous thing you can think of to say. He said it. And after that, it was tough for any of them to have a funeral face. <laughs> Ace, I don't remember all the Scott Jack stories, but I, I remember a lot of them being told, you know, at holidays and things when we were kids, and, and we'd come together as a family. He was part of the family. He was up here every Christmas. Country Ham. He, he loved Country Ham. I remember that. I remember him flying, or hearing the stories about him flying a plane, yeah. having the deer that he had that he had kept out in the yard and things. I can remember uh, stories about he and my grandfather, um, Going out, he would be going out and getting the grave rakes back then. He didn't have separate grave diggers. The funeral home would go out and dig the grave a lot of times and set up the grave and things. And just funny stories about, about Scott Jack. And he was full of yeah, there's, there's all kinds of them. I don't know all of them, but I know when Buddy and Dad used to get together and some of the other generators, they'd sit around and tell Scott Jack stories. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Is there any other questions I can answer for? You? Like I said, I'm sure there's a lot of detailed things and more dates and specific history, but that's kind of my perspective. I'd be happy to answer anything that I can or try and research for you anything that you'd like to know about. Yes, can I ask an old, old history question? Yeah, I've been told, and I, you know, pretty loose information, that mm -hmm. people really weren't embalmed that much until the Civil War, okay. and they embalmed the soldiers to get them back home. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's true? Have you ever heard that? Yes and no. I think probably in our, our American culture probably that's the case. Of course you can trace embalming practices all the way back to Egyptian history and everything else. Yeah. So you know, I think it depends upon <coughs> what they're considering as preservation practices and mm -hmm. things as well. But, yeah, I would think that, that probably did have something to do with it. Steve, I don't know, in mortuary school if you learned anything as far as the history of the Civil War and how that corresponded to it. But I think a portion of it was also the, the person's uh, own personal wealth, most probably, yeah. honestly, because you go to these battlefields and you'll see just acres and acres and acres of graves where men uh, passed right away there. in battle and they would bury them there at the battlefield, but yet other men would be sent back home. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure if, if funds were available, that would take place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've heard my husband say that. Uh, Apparently, they didn't have much embalming because uh, somebody had to sit up with the body because it was always the house, you know, and wave the flies away. So I don't think there was much embalming done then. But, but actually, but actually, if even with embalming, I mean, that, that would be feasible. That doesn't yeah. mean, especially if they were sitting up with them for any yeah. period of time, because everybody's biological makeup is different. Um, but from a decomposition standpoint, people will decompose fairly quickly. and. And so from that standpoint, without some embalming, I don't know that they'd be sitting up with them for very long. <laughs> and, and so in the old days then, did they, and so you die at home and they had it in the parlor, and so did they have to be pronounced, I mean, did you have to come, somebody came over and pronounced them dead, or they just knew I'm sure that the coroner or something back in those days didn't have to, although by law now, Oh, we yes. can't pronounce, make a pronouncement of death. We'll have someone who dies at home and a family will contact us and want us to come immediately out. The, one of the first questions we ask is, has, have they been under hospice care or in-home health care of some sort? If not, then we have to contact the coroner. The family needs to contact them so they can come out and make a pronouncement of death because by law we can't do that. Mm -hmm. So, But I will say this, I always got tickled at this too and really didn't think about it until I got older. Um, but for years, as most of you all know, there, there weren't EMTs, there weren't ambulances or anything. The funeral home ran the ambulance service. Mm -hmm. So when I was a kid growing up, and even you may see something on some of these ads or in some of the paperwork and things, um, my dad and buddy and my grandfather and all, there's all kinds of stories about going out and picking someone up to take them to the hospital or maybe for the birth of a baby and mm -hmm. dad and buddy fighting over, okay, you get back there. No, no, I'll just not get back there. <laughs> <laughs> um, or, you know, picking someone up who maybe been a scuffle or, or whatever else. But we, Steve and I, at Independence, when we were growing up, in mom and dad's bedroom, there was one of the old army radios that was there in the closet. And we would get, he would get calls across on that radio and it'd be CB and back and forth. And he'd go hop in a station wagon and take off. Mm -hmm. So um, that ambulance service, I think, ran for us till probably the mid to late 70s anyway. The last 
biggest thing I remember, I was telling somebody about this the other day, with him running the ambulance service was when the Beverly Hills Fire, our supper club, uh, was set on fire. I can remember being at the house that night and they sent out an all call and they were calling everybody in from all the fire departments and all the, you know, any, anybody they could get out there. And Dad went out and got in the vehicle and left. And we were kind of listening on, on the radio and watching on the news and listening to his, his army radio. And I had fallen asleep. But later on that night, Dad, when he got there, I guess walked up on the hillside and was overlooking the supper club. And at that time, they were saying there was only maybe 20 some, or they weren't saying there was very many people in there. And he'd gone up on the hillside, and I don't know why or how his view was or whatever. But as he was coming down the hill, Howard Aim at the time was just a rookie reporter. He just started with Channel 12, I guess it was. And he caught Dad. And and he said, well, what would you see up there? How many people do you think in there? And Dad said, two, three hundred people or whatever. Well, that sent shockwaves throughout. And they all started scattering, and it really got crazy. And so then from years on, all the anniversaries and all that stuff, they've always come back and interviewed him because he was the first one who had seen that to suspect there was that many people in the car. But that one really stands out to him. Never did. Yes, sir? You did something. Uh, yes, Chris. Um, tell you something about the happiest times. Um, of course, I was a just a young boy here in Baltimore uh, in the 40s, in 1940s. Uh, of course, I was a playmate of uh, your dad, mm -hmm. uh, Johnny, and Buddy. I graduated with Buddy from high school. But your grandma and grandpa always they treated the kids. Can believe how good it, uh, they treated us. Mm -hmm. uh, one of our favorite things that we did uh, here was out front. That was our ball field. <laughs> uh, so we'd all gather out there and play ball. One of our main objectives, and there was a few. I was talking to your dad uh, earlier tonight uh, about our ball games, but. Our favorite thing was uh, to see who could hit the ball from out here over on the roof of the game's theater. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and there was a few that did that, but <laughs> we was always welcome here. Uh, you know, especially when we was kids. And uh, we had some enjoyable times, really did. Michael, we can remember growing it up in the fence, and, and every day in the summertime, I always tell folks this, it reminds me, I don't know if any of you all have seen the movie Sandlot, but it reminded us because we had a backfield where now the renovation in the fence is that we grew up playing basketball and football, and in the parking lot, Dad had put a goal up for us when I was fairly young. We, The kids from all the, about four or five neighborhoods, there wasn't near the population then, but they would all come, and we'd gather about every day, and there'd be 15 to 20 bicycles out in the backyard lined up of all the kids. And the one thing, and the one thing here, I remember too, when I was little coming out and visiting mall, my grandmother, there was always a Coke machine. She used to carry around those little Coke bottles. You all remember, she never, hardly didn't have one in her hand. That was kind of her crutch. She loved having a Coca-Cola. And so she'd have that Coke machine out there. So that was a huge treat for us. So when the kids and my cousins and stuff would be up here playing in the lot, they'd come up here and sneak and get Cokes out of the <laughs> machine or when we were doing the same thing. But those were good times. Yeah, Ace, I'm sorry. Well, I apologize for being so talkative, but that's just my nagging state. <laughs> when I was a little boy, uh, Chambers and Grubbs did not have this funeral home, and Mr. Scott Chambers and Mrs. Chambers lived in the home that you marked or mentioned that had the market. But, but your great-grandparents lived where Aunt Jane lived, on the big house on the corner there at the curb. Yeah. And Buddy Grubbs <clears throat> was a little boy about this tall with long, curly hair, blonde hair. And he was the pet of the whole neighborhood. <laughs> Cute as he could be. Now, how all the time passed. <laughs> God is where we are now, I don't know. I, uh, when I was a little guy, and of course I was born in 1930, and, and I've got, I, can't, I don't know where my car keys are, but I have a weirdest memory for detail in the past. <laughs> But when we would go to the skating rink or the show or upstairs, uptown to, uh, to get a soft drink or something, we had to walk by the livery stable down there. 
Now, had that remained a livery stable, it would have been just another building. But when it had that big old funeral carriage in it, and I've seen it, it was gorgeous. It looked just like the pictures. Whatever happened to that? They, uh, my grandfather sold that while my dad was away at college. I think is a story to that. And Johnny was up in Pennsylvania on a, on a trip one time and happened to go into an antique shop. And evidently there was old candle lanterns or something that was on the side that had the initials for the funeral and stuff on it. And he, he saw one or two in the store. That's the only remaining parcel. So I, I have no idea whatever happened to the rest of it. But mm -hmm. that was a story I heard. About. Well, it was ornate, and I remember it well because I was with Uncle Scott, you know, in and out of things. I was with him a awful lot because he was so good to anybody, and he was awfully good to me. He's probably rotten. But we were in and out of that old building, and that was okay in the daytime. <laughs> but when I had to go home, lived on bed and driving at night and walk by there. <laughs> I, I whistled all the way. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I was concerned that was the spookiest place. In the world. And uh, of course, when you get a little older, you have a little more sense. And I remember after the war, the corner of it had Nathan Northgate and John Taylor, not Johnny across the street, but another John Taylor, had a little store there in the corner of it. And of course, Lusby's Grocery. When I was a little boy, there were six grocery stores in town. People walked to the grocery store. The funeral home had hardly any parking. Right. We would have the district tournament in the gym down here on Main Street, and people would park all over Walton. There wasn't a parking lot. Right. Stevens Restaurant was a successful Stevens a uh, successful restaurant without a parking lot. <laughs> but that was just the way it was. And so, where we went up and down the street was interesting to look back and think on because I remember your great grandfather very well, and your his. His adopted daughter, Ella May, was one of the prettiest girls in town. She was a cheerleader. And to show you how C. Scott Chambers was, she started going with a guy that most of us thought a lot of. He was rather handsome, nice guy. But C. Scott Chambers thought he'd never amount to anything, so he discouraged her. His name? R.C. Durr. <laughs> August 8, 1928. Papa was 57, and his wife, uh, Alta Chambers, Alta Terrell Chambers, she was a Terrell, was 47. Beautiful girl, I remember her well. <coughs> I never really got to know Alta. I never really So, uh, what do you know about the naming of the road after your relative? Mary Grubbs Highway? Okay. Well, and why? And Okay. Actually, there's a whole article up here on it, so I'm not going to, I can't remember the specific dates of it, but basically the reason for it is because she was the first licensed mortician in the state of Kentucky. Okay. So when they were looking, looking into doing naming rights, and some of you may know this better than, than I, at the time, her name was proposed as one of the potential people's names for it to be named after and why, and they ended up selecting her. And so that's how they came up. So, but there is an article up here on one of these boards that goes in a little bit more detail on it, but that's that's the summary of it. Yes, sir. Anything else I can answer? Well, I'm going to speak up again and say, Chris, you've done a wonderful job. Oh. <laughs> speakers usually talk about or how much factual detail or anything and, and really all I can go off of is stories that have been shared with me but Steve and I are very appreciative of our heritage and what our family um, has done before us and we're trying to follow in those footsteps and so in it, especially like I said in 2006 when we began doing the research for the history to celebrate the anniversary and things it became more evident and the older I become the older I get the more evident it becomes to me and the more important it becomes to me but uh, Buddy has always kind of been the fam family genealogist and family historian. And 
I don't know if it's by happenstance or whatever, I, I, I'm beginning to kind of follow in those footsteps just because of the research and things. But, but we really appreciate you being here. We really appreciate you taking the time. And I hope it, you found it interesting. I didn't bore you too much. Please, uh, please take some of those refreshments. Because like I said, we really don't want to take them home. But uh, we'd love for you to do that. And if, uh, if there's anything we can ever do to assist any of you, if you ever have any questions or if we can be any assistance, um, we're happy to do so. So thank you very much. Thank you.